Hi, this is Christopher Mosier from the Fan Film Podcast. We are on episode 54 for August 29th, 2009. And our guest this week is Mr. James Cawley from uh, Internet Series, uh, based on the franchise Juggernaut Star Trek. Um, initially, it was called New Voyages, and then it switched over to what was called Phase 2, and uh, that's what it is today. Uh, before Mr. Cawley's interview, I put in a little audio bit I stole off um, YouTube and stole from Paramount. And considering we don't make any money on this, just like fan films, I don't think they'd have any objections if I put it in there. I hope Mr. Collie doesn't mind that I put this in there. Uh, it's kind of a nice segue into into his show. Uh, kind of explains uh, the genesis from the 1970s series that initially never happened, but a lot of the stories and, and scripts and people uh, that were involved in it are now involved with Mr. Collie, and he'll explain all that as we go. So I'm going to stop yapping. And listen to this for about 10 minutes, and then Mr. Cawley will be uh, directly after. Thank you. 20 years before the debut of the United Paramount Network in 1995, the studio's effort to launch a second Star Trek series called Phase 2, as well as a new television network, led to Star Trek's leap to the big screen. This journey from the original television series to the first Star Trek film carried the cast and crew as far as their imagination, skill, and special effects technology could take them. Throughout the history of this landmark television and film series, producer-creator Gene Roddenberry nurtured and protected Star Trek with the utmost care. He wanted to talk. He wanted to, he wanted to find someone intelligent out there to go ahead and, and talk to. And so he found him. He found the audience which is something the networks never counted on, that these people could actually, you know, have intelligence. He wanted to be a writer. He wanted to get paid for his writing. He wanted to make, be able to make a living at doing only that. And the fact that he wanted a chance to put down his ideas on paper. He knew that he couldn't do it in the era that he was in. Censorship was so bad in those days that if uh, he could take things and switch them around a little bit and maybe paint somebody green and perhaps put weird uh, outfits on them and so forth, that he could get some of his ideas across because they wouldn't hit the censors. The censors weren't in those days really scanning every word, I guess. And so he got a lot of ideas through, and that's how Star Trek got born. When it went off the air, we finally pushed him back on. Uh, and, and, and said, give us a chance in syndication. But we don't have enough in syndication. There's 79 episodes, and you had to have 100. Um, but we went into uh, syndication, and, which was a smart move on Paramount's part by that time. The starship also runs on loyalty to one man, and nothing to replace it. When Star Trek was canceled, there was a strong group of fans, a large group of fans and viewers who were terribly upset. And the, the legend that has grown up about that is that the year Star Trek was canceled was the last year that the networks measured audience simply by numbers. The next year, they started measuring by demographics. That's the point where demographics came in. And then they started to say, aha, okay, if this is going to work out demographically, then maybe we've just got some of the wrong shows that we've been pushing. And the people at NBC looked at uh, the breakdown of the old ratings of Star Trek and said, boy, if we had known all these young adult males were watching back then, we would have never canceled the show. So it wasn't that a group uh, came into being when Star Trek went into syndication. That group had always been there. And when but suddenly it was the perception of them, who they were, they looked at them as a group, and that all-important 18 to 24 and up, that group was represented by Star Trek in surprising numbers. And they thought, oh, wow, okay, we'll stick it here in the news. It won't get anybody then, and we'll, we'll use this up, and uh, it won't be a problem anymore. It's just going to be one of those shows that has lost that much money. And young adult males weren't too interested in watching the 6 o'clock news, but they were interested in seeing Star Trek, especially since some of the episodes had run as late at 10 o'clock at night. And the kids might have missed it when they were 14, but now that they were 16, 17, 18, mm -hmm. they could see it. Well, sure enough, we put it on at 6 o'clock at night, and the kids are home, and mom's home, and they're doing dishes, or um, they're just starting to eat, and um, that did it, right there. I mean, the, the ceiling went up, uh, and everybody in the world started to watch Star Trek. Okay. 
Paramount was not... Uh, they, they realized that Star Trek was very successful. And uh, the frustration they felt was, we had a shot, we missed it, we have this property that's worth a lot. And how do we redevelop it and how do we reconnect? And also they were thinking, and it seems like history is repeating itself, the Paramount Network was just about to come into being. At that point, Paramount decided they were going to start a fourth network, and Star Trek was going to be Star Trek Phase Two was going to be the flagship of that network. Um, Harold Livingston was brought in as the uh, the writing producer. I was hired as the creative producer, and Bob Goodwin was the uh, line producer. And uh, Gene was the executive producer. Gene was coming back in for Star Trek. Um, and the interesting thing about that was that I had spoken to him in the, the, uh, the months before, and we had talked about Star Trek, and he was really not all that enthusiastic about going back to Star Trek, and that's something that has not necessarily been revealed a whole lot. He was, uh, he was feeling like, been there, done that, he wanted to move on and prove himself in other areas. Um, but, of course, when Star Trek came, he took it. He had so many good shows. And he didn't, he never got to think about anything but Star Trek as soon as he would start to grow away from it. And so on, their Paramount would come and they would hit him over the head with it again. And he had started to think of it as, well, I guess it's my baby. Maybe this is what I'm meant to do. John Colville was the, uh, he was Gene's uh, assistant. I was both sitting in on story meetings and doing things like getting Gene's car washed. Uh, so, um... The But Harold found that when I was sitting in on the story meetings that I had a lot to offer, that I, could, I had good knowledge of what had been done on Star Trek, I had good knowledge of the characters, and I had good sense of story structure that all, you know, when I contributed in the meetings, he found that the contributions were very valuable. And he, he felt that I was acting like a story editor, I was performing like a story editor, I should be called a story editor and be paid as a story editor. Alan Dean Foster had this, uh, uh, had submitted this story about V'ger, and, uh, which I liked and Gene liked, and uh, we agreed to develop it. And that was in my image, and uh, it was, uh, it was about I don't remember whether it was Voyager in the original presentation, but it was about a satellite that had been launched and disappeared and uh, and went to a machine planet, wound up at a machine planet where it was sort of adopted and enhanced and sent back. And... Um, and in the uh, and in the process became something very dangerous that needed to be dealt with. And Foster went off somewhere I don't know, and uh, I wasn't concerned about that. I wanted to find a writer to do this pilot, and I couldn't. Uh, I finally, finally, I got Bill Norton, who was a pretty well respected writer. He agreed to do it, and two weeks later, he called me and said that he couldn't do it. And now I now had five weeks to go. So I, I, I had no choice, but I, I, I had to go home, close the doors, lay on the floor, and write the thing myself, which I didn't want to do. But I knew I had five weeks to do it. And I was young in those days and uh, had a lot of resiliency. And I wrote the script. Inside Star Trek, we thought it was going to be a series, and then we heard rumors it was going to be a film, and then we heard it was going to be a series again, and went back and forth about four times. So then it would be once a month it was going to be on, and I tell you, it was so confusing, I forget what they were even called by now. So with all the uh, back and forth of Star Trek, is it going to be a movie, is it going to be a big movie, an expensive movie, is it going to be a television series, finally they made the decision we're going to make the Paramount Television Network and Star Trek, the second Star Trek series with uh, Leonard Nimoy, William Shatner, and all the regular cast on that second five-year mission, mm -hmm. we're going to go ahead. They wanted everybody, all the originals back. Uh, they didn't get Leonard. 
um, and that necessitated the uh, the creation of a new character to replace Spock, and uh, and that character was Zahn. My readings seem to indicate some sort of sensor unit attached to each device. My take on the character, which pretty much remained true through all of my exploration of Zahn. What I did get was that he was a full Vulcan, had no human connection, emotional, that emotions had been outlawed from his planet generationally as a way of stopping wars from occurring. I don't feel an attack is the logical approach at this moment. If you will allow me to take further readings, I could... The first screen test that we did for Zahn, they probably brought in as many actors that would fit that physical description of the time. Zahn was like a 23, 24, 25-year-old, fresh out of the Vulcan Science Academy, you know, young, engaging sort of a character. And there was a lot of actors that I recognized from a lot of different theaters and actors who had done a lot of other film work. So it was a very competitive day. You could feel it like a football game. Who's going to throw the pass? Who's going to catch the pass? And I won. I won that football game. We had the series that had been announced to be the linchpin of the Paramount Television Network. It was the new Star Trek series. They were redesigning the Enterprise, building sets. They were commissioning scripts. They were having meetings. They were figuring out what life was going to be like in the 23rd century and doing what the new communicators would do. production take. tests of what the engine room would look like, doing makeup tests of what Aaliyah would look like. In August 3rd, 1977, which was less than two months after phase two had been announced there was a meeting which included michael eisner and uh bob goodwin and bob goodwin gene roddenberry and uh, everyone else involved in the production of the show and bob goodwin pitched to michael eisner the story in thy image by alan dean foster and bob goodwin says that at that meeting michael eisner heard the story and he slammed his hand down on the table, and he said, gentlemen, we've been looking for a Star Trek motion picture for five years, and this is it. After the stunning success of the first motion picture, Star Trek was firmly established as a tentpole franchise for Paramount and led to a series of popular films. And though Star Trek did return very successfully to the small screen in 1987 with Star Trek The Next Generation, and followed by Star Trek Deep Space Nine in 1993, it would not be until 1995 that the fifth network, UPN, would come together with the premiere of Star Trek Voyager. With Voyager's retirement in 2001, Star Trek's fifth incarnation, Enterprise, was born. Star Trek, continuing to go where no entertainment franchise has gone before. And of course, as you probably well know, the UPN uh, went in the proverbial crapper. And uh, they are no more. They merged with the WB, uh, owned by the CBS Corporation, and of course th today they're um, the CW. But of course the story continues because uh, Mr. James Colley took this Phase Two idea from shit uh, 30 years ago, and uh, he ran with it. So let's give him a talking to. The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. Space, the final frontier. These are the new voyages of the starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. James Colley on the other line here. Very good. Uh, James, this is my co-host. His name is, uh, well, he goes by the uh, name of Fanboy Will. 
Fanboy Will. Yeah. Yes, sir. How you doing, bro? How you doing, buddy? I'm good. Good. Hey, good you, to hear you. Before we got started, uh, did you have any questions for us? Uh, no, I don't. Really. You're probably used to this stuff. I've done several of these. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, I've never done one with anybody called Fanboy Will, though. This will be interesting. My real name is William McKenzie, but I don't like going by that best. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just kind of like a little moniker. Uh, yeah. It's just kind of like a, you, you make me a little different, I guess, from all the other dorks out there, you know. <laughs> I'm going to come forward and call myself a fanboy. Have somebody say fanboy behind my back, you know. Gotcha. I'm like, oh, I'm already a fanboy, so that's that. Now yeah, we're all fanboys. Yeah, exactly. Why are we here? That's exactly the reason we're here right at this moment. We are all fanboys. Yes, we're trekkers, we're trickies, we're fanboys, and the whole nine yards. Got what, it. Is, what was the argument? Is it true? What it do you is, think? It is trekkies. Is it? Would uh, you say trekkies? It, well, Tre- Roddenberry said it was trekkies. And they made two uh, documentaries called trekkies. Yep. Yeah. One and two. I think trekkers are the people that are on the outside who don't want people to think they're good. <laughs> yeah, those are like the indie rock people. This is like Sonic, you right. know, like the mop haircuts and watch Star Trek. Like, hey, man, I watch Trek, but it's on the down low. If you don't have the balls to call yourself a trekkie, you're not a fan. Get out Come on. Right, no, exactly. seriously. They're kind of still in the closet, if I can exactly. <laughs> throw, that, throw that out there. <laughs> so we are speaking with Mr. James Colley, correct? That is it. All right. So your name is easy, man. The other I know. We get some, we get some doozies. <laughs> And he has uh, done these fan films for, uh, I guess, uh, New Voyages it started out as, and then uh, they they changed the name to Phase 2, which we'll ask James about. And um, now where do we start with you? (laughs) (laughs) We'll start wherever you like, I guess. You've got a uh, full resume. Um, Well, I guess uh, let's just start how you got into it. I mean, your name's James. Okay, Jim Kirk, James Kirk. Were your uh, parents... I just got that 10 minutes ago. I was like, wait a minute. (laughs) All this research, I mean, like, I love your movies. I watch them all the time, but I was like, hmm. Yeah, James oh God, plus James, James equals yeah. James. Right. So, Jim, were you, your parents, um, were they Trekkies at all, or was that all coincidental? I, I imagine it was. It was very coincidental. I mean, my father watched it casually. Uh, he, never, he never quite understood it, but, uh, you know, he watched it casually. He wasn't, he wasn't a fan like I was. And, uh, you know, I remember being very young in the 70s, and they would use it as leverage. You know, if you want to watch Star Trek, you have to get this done, and you have to do your chores, or, you know. <laughs> he was pretty smart. He could tell even then, you know, how much I cared about it. So. <laughs> did he go, for God's sake, Jim, empty the garbage? <laughs> yeah, no, he never did that. No. <laughs> go Tiberius. Now, what got you? Um, obviously, you're a big Star Trek fan. I mean, you you watched it as a kid. But what give give me the point to when you were a Star Trek fan as a kid? What led up to where you were internship to uh, the next generation? Well, you know, there wasn't anything really as a kid. So, my, I mean, I, I always watched the show, and and I would always dress up, you know, and 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 had my mom make make me my own uniform, and the neighborhood kids all we all played Star Trek, and my father actually converted a part of our basement into the Enterprise for us to play. Oh, that's awesome. So, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it was just it was harmless, you know. It was good fun in those days, you know. We didn't have video games and all that stuff, and and kids still ran around outdoors, and they weren't afraid of being abducted, and you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, different world back then. Exactly. And, um, I was always, I guess. A part of me always wanted to be an actor, and, and uh, you know, as I got older, I was always about, even at Halloween, you know, I had to have the right costume. I had, I had to look right. It could be off. If it was off, I wouldn't wear it. And uh, right. I graduated uh, from high school and um, just decided, you know, that I, I had to find out everything I could about the Star Trek costume because I was never satisfied with what I had. And uh, one day I just got real ballsy and I called Paramount Pictures. I got the, the number from the operator. And um, uh, when I rang the studio, I asked for, for Bill Tice. I mispronounced his name, but they knew who I wanted. Uh, they rang his office and he answered the phone, which I was shocked that it was that easy in those days. Huh. And um, struck up a, a friendship with him over the phone. and. That uh, one thing led to another. He was he was you know quite impressed with my knowledge of, of the costume and um, uh, yeah. You know, at that point, uh, Next Generation was just gearing up, and so I was calling this guy you know every other day, having long uh-huh. conversations. And finally, he said to me, "You know, you're so into this stuff. Why don't you why don't you try to make something and and I'll see if we can use it or I'll put you to work." And that's basically where it, where it happened. Wow. Now, now, what uh, season of uh, Next Gen was this about, or was this, this... was the first season? Was it okay? Uh, in, into the middle of the second season, Bill actually only did the first season, um, and his health deteriorated, and uh, Dorinda Wood uh, took over for the second season. But 
Uh, he was a terrific fella. He was, um, you know, a lot of people thought he was moody, and uh, but he, you know, he was very driven. It was all about the job for him. It was, it was a job, and he never quite understood the fascination with a pullover shirt, you know, made out of velour. He never quite, <laughs> that. Um, you know, why the fans loved him so much. He, he never quite right. figured it out. But it was really cool to. You get to know the fella. Well, I see here that you got a. You're a big collector of the the props and the actual costumes from the actual original series. Yeah. How did you come across these? This is like convention at Z-Bay. Where did you get all these little well, you treasures? Know, you know, in the in the in the eighties, particularly, it was like an underground kind of thing. Right. You, if you had these kinds of things, you you there was like a a certain uh, you know group of people that knew it, and you traded them and you bought them amongst yourselves and. I don't know really when the explosion happened. I guess it was probably the mid to late 90s that, that, that this underground hobby sort of people realized there was big money to be made in it. And, and mm-hmm. you know, even Hollywood sort of throw their hat in as far as selling things. But, you know, in the old days with fandom, you know, when you met somebody, you know, you, you had those conversations and you immediately figured out what you guys had in common and you know just Mm -hmm. one person leads you to another to another and you just you know you make a a circle of friends so that's how the collecting started basically very cool what do you what kind of thing i have to boast about besides the costumes do you have any like you know like maybe klingon you know you know weapons or do you have any pieces pieces or something no i really don't you know i have a lot of a lot of props that are reproductions that are like uh, rocks and stuff like the paper mache yeah. rocks <laughs> yeah no, i have a lot of uh, a lot of reproduction stuff that have been done by that's cool you know prop makers in hollywood and other friends i've just got tons right. of that stuff but uh, the stuff that means the most to me are, of course is the wardrobe pieces that i've collected and uh-huh. and i really love uh, I, I love the old stills from the 60s because there's so many shots and things from the original series that most people have never seen there was a lot of publicity photographs and, so stuff like that you know that you don't really get a chance to see much is the stuff that i'm into special features that, that's a good uh, starting point to to where he got the blueprints for the yeah. original yeah well, Enterprise. that was uh, that was from Bill Tice himself. In, in, wow! In the, in the '60s, if you were a department head, you were copied on everything, just about. You know, because I, maybe they needed fabric for a set. Who knows? But um, Bill Tice had a full a full set of these blueprints. And um, I don't know. I guess it was about a year before he passed. Actually, I, he, uh, I got this package in the mail, and it was a bunch of Star Trek memorabilia that he had saved, and and they were in there. So wow! It's just stuff that he passed on to me, and then it's fate. Yeah. And then and then you never looked at him again. You I never used for out. any purpose. Uh, I, I realized at that point I actually had the keys to the car. Yeah. So. <laughs> you lined the birdcage with it, and that was a... Uh... It was an amazing moment, because, you know, once I saw it, it kind of opened the door, so, you know, you see sort of something, but you don't really know how it's put together, or you right. don't really know how big it you're is. You're just overwhelmed. You're like, oh, my God, look at all this. I mean, all the information yeah. was there, every every last detail of, of how, you know, they planned to make it and what size it was. So it was really right. easy to, to just sit down and say, okay, uh, this piece goes to this piece, and it's this big. So. I'm impressed. Do you have any, like, carpentry skills, or are you just kind of uh, just well, did you know, your own thing? My dad and my grandfather were kind of, you know, I call them amateur carpenters. They did all the all the remodeling in our home and all that kind of thing. So Their dad. So that's a dad, yeah, you know? Oh, well, he was building stuff downstairs for him. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you just kind of hang around your dad and, or your grandfather. There you go. And you teach. They teach and you learn and you just right. it up. That's I'm not very a, cool. I'm not a great carpenter, but, you know, I'm, I'm a good hack, I guess. <laughs> so did those plans, was that the, I guess, seed? For, did you have an inclination to be making a film, or did you just want to reproduce you know the I Starship always, Enterprise Bridge? I always wanted to be in Star Trek, and oh. uh, I figured uh, if, if I couldn't be in that one, I would make my own. And uh, once I got you know, old enough and I had the, the keys to the car, so to speak, I knew mm-hmm. it was a matter of time. And so... You know, by that time I had embarked on my, my full-time life, you know, as an entertainer and, and uh, was making fairly decent money. And I thought, you know what? In my spare time, I'm going to do this. There you go. And That's just, the fan film spirit. I just, I'm going to do this. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, withstood a lot of scorn from people who didn't understand it. <laughs> but I, I did For it. sure. And I've had a lot of fun. That's Absolutely. the main thing. If you're not having fun, something's wrong. Yeah, no, I mean, once, uh, once it's not fun, then, then it's time to call it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, now should, should we touch on what you actually do? For I, I imagine it's for a living, right? I do. You know, a lot of people think it's weird, but, but I, I've I think it's weird at all. For a long time now. All the hey, I'm a porn star, so no. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm uh, uh, So that's going to be different to me. <laughs> I've had opportunities to be a porn star. <laughs> hey, there you go. Hey, I can empathize. Now, this I'm a face feeling. man of porn. That's even more... That's even more, more Pathetic. I mean, it is. I thought Captain Kirk was the spaceman of porn. I'm not done being immature, goddammit. 
<laughs> Come on. Where did the impersonation started and trying to link it up as far as making the money to, to get the Enterprise Bridge well, built? Well, you know, it started, the, the impersonation thing started. I had a part-time job in high school at a radio station. Mm-hmm. And I have to backtrack because uh, my father and my mother graduated high school in 1957. So to those guys as teenagers, the all and end all of the world was Elvis, you know, and, and mm-hmm. my father thought he was the Mac Daddy of all. So <laughs> <laughs> he's the original. I grew up with that music, you know, yeah. in the car, in the house, and, uh, you know. Was he making poses in the living room and stuff, no, pointing his finger? it out. wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. But, you know, my, my I remember my father, the one thing he always told me is that, you know, growing up in the 50s, man, you, you, there was two, two, two kinds of guys. The guys that were jealous and hated him, or the guys that just wanted to be him because he was, you know, they knew he was getting all the chicks. Yeah, right. You know, and so you know, you had this contingent of young guys who who would wear the leather jackets and stick their hair up, you know, because they wanted to be like Elvis, and that was what my dad was. You know, he wanted, he thought Elvis was cool, you know, so be like Elvis. But there was never, you know, an aspiration on my father's part to 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 talk like Elvis or any of that kind of thing, but. You know, he just liked it, loved the music, and so it was always around while I was growing up. So you got what I hear you. Hey, so let me go finish them chores over there. So I got to finish them chores. I got a part-time job and um, uh, played music at the radio station, and uh, they approached me to, to do some sort of wacky Elvis commercial, which I did, and uh, <laughs> then they talked me into a talent show, which I did, which went over very well. And uh, when I was in California, I met a, uh, a producer who was putting together an Elvis show and said, hey, uh, audition. I auditioned. I got the job. I opened the Tropicana Casino in Atlantic City. And oh, wow. Oh, wow. Never looked back. Max, holy mackerel. Let's go. Can you do a little uh, Elvis impression right now? Would I do it? No, I wouldn't. No. <laughs> Put you on the spot. I, I have a you were doing now. Yeah. The impersonation is a funny thing. You know, there's the guys that, that, that dress up and they just, they're always on, as I call it, and it drives me crazy. I, uh-huh. I'm, I'm, I'm more, more of an actor, and I, I do it when I'm on stage because it's what okay. I get paid to do. I, do. I hear you. I'm like that, too. Uh, you know, people know I do an impersonation. They're like, do it. We'll do it. And I'm right. just like, uh, I can't do it now. <laughs> yeah, it's, Maybe if you give me a couple bottles of Jack Daniels, I'll do it. <laughs> it's like working at McDonald's and trying to eat there, you know? <laughs> oh. So you, so you made, so you, you became an Elvis impersonator. I did. You made a certain plus amount of money with that. Now okay. link that to how you built this bridge and so it was a used car dealership well that no, actually I, i've been in three different buildings over the years um the used car building is the one that we've been in now for five years but when i started wow. the project it was like if i was on the road touring um on a day off i would go out you know looking for star trekky things to decorate sets with you know make costumes with and i'd buy them and send them home or whatever but when I would come off the road and come home then I would have free time to, to work on things so I would go up to my grandfather's wood shop and just start building you know and we were putting this thing together my, my grandfather called it Project Blast Off and uh, so we would just build this you know different pieces of, of a set and um, then I'd go back on the road and forget about it for a while and come back home and work on it again and so, I, you know, I've rented different buildings until we got this space, which is big enough to do the whole thing. So initially it was kind of a hobby kind of thing? It was. You know, I yeah. knew I was going to do it. I wasn't in a rush to do it. Um, right. One, I didn't, I didn't have all that time to, to just come off the road and do it. But, but I always knew that at some point I would take that grand leap and just, just do it. And you're the year Atlantic City. I mean, you're making some some pretty good bucks, probably. I can I can. I was a headliner, and and I and I still am. I'm, in fact, I'll be at the uh, the Hard Rock Hotel in Fort Lauderdale in the winter. So I still do it. And I, you know, watching the original episodes, the first couple episodes of the New Voyages, I can kind of you, you, you got the hair going there as James. <laughs> well, that's just, yeah, I'm like, why does his hair? He's an awesome person. Why does his hair look like Elvis? You know, and, and I, yeah, a lot of, I took a lot of shit for that. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Fanboys in particular were probably. Like, hey, there, that's not correct. Just to set the record straight, I was. Let I me was, tell you performing as Elvis seven days a week at Six Flags. And uh, I was driving an hour to work, driving an hour home. I would literally shower, eat, put a Star Trek uniform on, and film until 2 or 3 in the morning. Wow. And repeat the Elvis routine and then come home. Oh, my God. <laughs> That'd be kind of funny if you, like, uh, you know, script with the Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were, there was one moment on the set, as I recall. You know, oh, that'd we were, be hilarious. We were slipping in and out of Elvis for a while on the set, having some laughs with it. Hey. And, uh, James, you're in the wrong costume. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Joe Volkins. 
<laughs> we have oh, yeah, Mr. Spock, warp two. Mm -hmm. The fellow that directed that pilot um, was the guy that actually kicked me in the ass to, to really get going, and his name was Jack Marshall, and he called me. He was going to be working on another fan film project, and, and he had a disagreement with them, and he, he called me up and he said, dude, why do you have this stuff? I mean, what, you, you must have a reason. And I said, I just want to play Captain Kirk. I've always yeah. wanted to do it. And he said, well, then let's just do it. And his kind of energy that he had at that time was what I needed at that moment in my life to say, okay, screw this, let's just do it. And uh, I will forever give him credit for that because he, he was responsible for kicking me in the backside when I needed it most. Right. you got to have that one person that does that for you. And, then, you know, it, at first it's kind of like, oh, thanks for the kick. On the, and then you look back and you're like, that's what drove me. That's what made me where I am right now, you know? Well, you like, know, I just wasn't in a hurry to do it. I always wanted to do it right. Just kind of like a leisurely hobby kind of a thing. Yeah, but, you know, he had some infectious uh, demeanor, um, and he had, a, he had a camera, and he had some, some knowledge-making film, and he had some friends that were willing to act. And, right. And, you know, coupled with all the resources that I had, it just made sense to say, okay, what am I waiting for? Let's just try this. And, uh, you know, that's what happened. Uh, I see here that you actually had, uh, like, original, uh, an original, so one person in particular, uh, David Gerald, who is a writer for Star Trek, the, the real deal. And he decided to write an episode, or episodes, if I'm not correct, and direct. Well, uh, you know, when I first started it, I always, I had my eyes uh, set on Blood and Swag. It was this fabled story that was written for the next generation that was shelved you know, right. for controversial reasons. So it was on my oh, list okay. of stories, you know, if I could, God, if I could get this story. And it just kind of fell to the, to the, to the back as things went along. And then we flash forwarded to that 2005. And um, uh, a mutual friend introduced me to Walter Koenig, and Walter said, oh, I'd love to do the show. Let's, let's get the right story. And uh -huh. so then Walter introduced, introduced us all to D.C. Fontana. DC wrote Walter's script and struck up a great friendship with her, and it was her that said, you know, when I talked to her about um, Blood and Fire and so forth, she said, let me call David for you. Mm -hmm. and so she introduced me to David Gerald, and he and I hit it off and became the best of friends. And oh, that's great. Yeah, he's just this wonderful guy. You talk about somebody that's infectious. This guy's just incredible. <laughs> Very um, nice. And he, he said, you know, I'd love to do it, but you know, he said, I got really stung by, the, by, by Paramount and by Rick Berman and these guys when this went down. And I, he's a little bitter. Yeah, he said to me, he said, Understandably. What, what can I do and what can I do? And I, and, and I said, David, the gloves are off. I said, you can say anything you want and tell the story mm -hmm. however you want. Because in my mind, at that point, Star Trek had become far too safe, and that's what was killing the show. Uh, yeah, yeah exactly. Stopped, they stopped telling stories that were relevant to people yeah. or about people. I mean, look at the controversy between Uhura and Kirk kissing for the first time. That was like a huge, <laughs> exactly. big-time deal. That was like, oh, my God, you know? <laughs> You know, to this day, when you watch those original episodes, there's something in every one of them that that makes you go, "Holy God, I didn't I didn't really notice that the first." It, it's totally true. It's amazing. Totally true. Uh, the, the stuff that they were able to grab onto and get by the censors when you really pay attention, they were they were bright bats. Like for that time, for this great thing about science fiction, stuff like that, that. It was pretty 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 severe. Let's let's backtrack a little bit because um, initially there was supposed to be in the 70s there was supposed to be a second Star Trek series because of um, syndication of the first series. I you, you tell me, James, if I'm incorrect here. But there was supposed to be a second series, but then the student decided, well, we can make more money making motion pictures. And you well, kind of picked up on that. Is that close. how this came yeah, about? You're, you're close. Okay. They, for, for several years in the early 70s, they were trying to bring Star Trek back. First it was going to be a feature film. Then it was going to be a TV movie. Then they ultimately decided it was going to be a new series. And they actually you know, built all the sets, and they, they dra dragged out all the old you know, 1960s wardrobe, and then and then built even more of that. So the uniforms were going to look exactly the way that is we remember them. Um, they did update the sets. They cast uh, Persis Combata to play Ilea. There was test footage shot of all these yeah. people in the original costumes, and then um, the script came for the pilot of that series. And when they pitched the pilot. A final script to uh, Michael Eisner, he slammed his fist on the table and said, we've been looking for a Star Trek here for X number of years. This is it. So the, he made the decision to stop it and make it a feature film at that point. So that's why the series did not go, go forward, essentially. They were looking for a movie. They got it. Is that where you picked up? I mean, is that a thread that got it you is. into doing the new it voyage? Is. It is because there were, there, were, there were 13 or 14 scripts written for that season that were never filmed. Um, I was, I was always intrigued by the stills wow. that I saw from all of that. And I had, 
you know, we'd produce episodes of it as new voyages, and then I had some cast changes that had happened, and, um, you know, there were some behind-the-scenes politics, even with some people that worked on the show with me, uh, because uh, when we did the George Takei episode, that was the first episode that I actually called the shots on from the wow. end. I chose the script, and I was a tyrant, you know, and uh, <laughs> some people disagreed with my choices, but, uh, you know, the proof was in the final episode, I think, um, and uh, Mark Zakri was brilliant. He wrote it. He directed it very well. Uh, George Takei was terrific, uh, you know, and so I just said, okay, this is a turning point, so... Uh, every episode going forward, now I'm, gonna, I'm going to indulge myself, and we're going to call it Phase 2 because I was always enamored of that, hence the name change. Okay, well, there we go. That's the name change question taken care of. If I was going to have that out, Will. I got it. I got it. I got a checklist here. I'm just trying to get things in, you know, in order, succinct order. Yes. Trying to, anyways. There's so many threads with James here. <laughs> <laughs> I love the OCD things. podcast. We uh, <laughs> check the door 50 times before we leave and uh, make sure our guests are completely satisfied. Cool. <laughs> So uh, let's talk about your other cast members, uh, uh, all the way from the first film up to your latest film. There's been changes along the way, but the, what I find kind of funny is some of the cast members you've chosen, play Bones, Sulu, you know, who, who, whatnot, all, all the crew members, Scotty, have been in kind of almost like similar type of professions. To the, you got the Bones, who's actually, uh, what is he, a urologist, I believe. He is. He is he's and he's a great Bones. How did you uh, how did you run into these guys? Did these guys contact you? Did you know them? Uh, well, in the beginning, we, we uh, had a, uh, a posting on one of those trek, uh, you know, one board. of the many websites. Yeah, it was just a website, and there was a posting that we were doing this and that we were looking for, you know, volunteers and so forth, and uh, John Kelly applied, and he came, and he was actually a background character. We shot the pilot with somebody else playing McCoy, and um, it was just horrible. So we just started talking to John, and it just made sense, oh, this guy should be McCoy. <laughs> so we went back and we reshot whole portions of the thing with John playing McCoy and fixed it. I still hate our pilot. I really hate it. Captain, I do not recall previously viewing this representation. What, Spock? the musical composition you have on display. Oh, you mean the hymn? That belonged to my brother Sam. My mother gave it to he and Arelan when they left for Denova. What is it, Spock? I do not understand the words. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm... was blind, but now I see. Well, Spock is about us. It's about what we're supposedly doing out here. Extending compassion to those in need. Saving the lost. Helping those people who can't help themselves and asking nothing in return. But the song would seem to indicate a deity. Were not the religious conflicts of your world what led your species to the brink of destruction? Yes, but it's the ideal that survives. Then the hymn is still relevant. I shall endeavor to study it further. Ah, come on, man. You're nitpicking. It's just very difficult for me to watch because the script was never... Uh, anything of any importance, and uh, I was I was, I was I was a I was a walking uh, computer. I mean, I didn't know what time of day it was half the time, and <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it was tough. It was really tough, but we had a good time making it, and we that's proved the thing. we proved that we could make it. And that's you can do it. You can make it look like it looked like a real Trek episode. That was your yeah. first one. I mean, not many people could say that with their new Trek films that are like you know all these special effects and people are wearing the right costumes and everything's great, and then you're like. But it it's this not Beck. Yeah. I mean, you guys open with the old what the CBS Peacock or is it NBC yeah, or something? Yeah. The NBC Peacock, like that's a true attention to detail. Well, that's yeah. like wow. This is what opened every show in the 1960s. For six people sitting around their little TV, their TV dinners, you know, and their son was off in Vietnam. And before the show came on, that, that's what happened. I mean, that is true. Just just faith. And and, and, and and just being a stick detail. And that's what I think makes your fan film so incredible. Well, so, if you talk to my staff, sometimes they, they hate me for that. No, jeez. Let detail. me talk to the staff. <laughs> Give me a break. Sometimes, sometimes I, I, I get on them, you know, very, very hard. And, and they're like, oh, God, do we have to do that? And it's like, <laughs> Yeah. Well, oh, dude, it, 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 it looks fantastic. Like, your well, films you know, are great, man. I appreciate it. I have this group of people, you yeah. know, they fly literally from all over the world to come and there do you go. twice a year. I'm not kidding. They come from as far away as Australia, for God's sake. I don't, I don't doubt it. And, and they 
bust their their collective asses for yeah. you know ten to twelve days to make an episode, and and literally, you know, I tell everybody says, oh, you know, your stuff is the best. Well, it's not just my stuff; it's their stuff. They they are pouring everything they have into these things, and and really, I couldn't do it without them. Not to right. the level that we've achieved. I just couldn't do it. The terrific folks. I mean, look at Jeff Hayes for God's sake; he's he's amazing. <laughs> Uh, we would be. Yeah, I don't know if you listened to our Jeff Hayes episode, but uh, I did because uh, he's, he he's, he emailed me and said, "Hey, yeah, I did this, and and um, these guys, I think, want to talk to you." So I mean, that's yeah. And we, we have to him. thank him for. Uh, you, yeah, because initially, um, it was back in early spring. I emailed whomever takes care of your emails, uh, seeing if you can be on the show. La 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 la. And then they said, "Well, James is very busy. He's off doing this and that and that." Okay. So I waited a couple months. I, I emailed him back. I said, well, you know, just as a heads up, we're still interested in talking to James. Well, he's off doing this. I will contact you once, you know, he's free. Well, you know, it's so. been, since last uh, summer, since last June, not the June that just ended, but a year ago, it's, it's been incredibly crazy. Because no, I'm sure. We have had, well, we filmed Blood and Fire. We filmed part one and part two. And we've had part two in, uh, in post-production for a little over a year because it's just been so crazy. And then last June we shot Enemy Starfleet, which has gone into post-production. Then last October, right on the heels of it, we shot The Child with John Povel. And then this June we shot uh, Ketumba. And, and and in the midst of all of that, this whole Buck Rogers thing exploded. And yeah. so uh, there's another, there's another question exploded. for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One minute to auto-destruct. And we're going to cut this week's fan film podcast right here. And next week we're going to pick right up with Mr. James Colley for part two as he discusses his Buck Rogers project. Hey, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Peace.